thanks Supriti for the nice introduction. Yes, really, we are very enthusiastic for exploring reversibility from such all different angles, which will surely help us to gain different kind of new insights. Now, I want to invite our first speaker for the day one of this webinar series, Professor Shushmita Shulkole. Let me introduce her briefly. Professor Shulkole is currently a professor in the Advanced Computing and Microelectronics Unit of the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, where she joined as faculty in 1999. She received her BTEC Honours degree in Electronics and Electrical Communications Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and the PhD degree in Computer Science and Engineering from Jadavpur University, India. During the period of 1993 to 99, she was a reader in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Jadavpur University. Prior to that, she was a postdoc fellow at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and a research assistant at the Laboratory of Computer Science in MIT. She was also on sabbatical at Princeton University and Intel Corporation USA. She has received several accolades and awards. She was a recipient of the President of India Gold Medal in 1980 for her record performance in BTEC. Apart from that, she has received IBM Faculty Award 2009, Fellow of the Institute of Engineers India 2010, Fellow of the Institute of Electronics and Telecommunications Engineer 2009, Distinguished Alumnus Award IIT Kharagpur 2020, and Women in Technology Leadership Award from BLSI Society of India 2022, among many others. In her long career in research, her research contributions are in the areas of algorithm design automation for VLSI physical design, fault modeling and testing, synthesis of quantum computers and graph algorithm. She has co-authored several technical papers in leading international journals and referred conference proceedings, as well as many books and book chapters. Today, she is going to give us a talk on logic synthesis methods for reversible and quantum circuits. So thank you, ma'am, once again for accepting our invitation. Uh, over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to this webinar series uh, on reversibility. Uh, allow me to share my screen, please. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me put it on uh, presentation mode. Is it visible now? No, ma'am. Presentation is not coming. You have to share the screen, I think. Only the first page is coming actually. Uh, maybe the entire screen has to be shared. Yeah, I'll stop presenting. How about now? Uh, no, nothing is visible till now, ma'am. Sorry? Uh, nothing is visible till now, ma'am. Uh, what about now? Uh, Ma'am, I think you are sharing the window for the PPT, but uh, you have to probably share the whole screen. Then only the presentation will come. 
I know. That's what I tried. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Now it's all right. Okay. Sorry for the delay. So today, uh, what I will uh, cover uh, are some uh, logic synthesis uh, methods or algorithmic way to design reversible and quantum circuits. I'd like to acknowledge uh, a number of my collaborators who were my students and uh, fellow researchers from various uh, universities, and uh, some of them have graduated and are in industry now. The outline is that I will very briefly uh, describe what I mean by reversible logic, and then move on to quantum logic, and then uh, cover some of the synthesis techniques that I've been associated with, and connect you know, why reversibility is uh, also very relevant to uh, quantum computing uh, today. So as uh, we heard that reversible uh, computation uh, is very um, useful, people are in interested because way back in 1961, um, uh, Rob Landau uh, showed that reversible computation uh, has, is um, very effective for minimizing power. And Charles Bennett took it up, and uh, particularly for reversible computation, how it can be done. According to the laws of physics, information like energy is conserved in the universe. And so an energy lossless computation must therefore be information lossless. Therefore, we would expect reversible computation to be uh, information lossless. And ideally, this would receive it zero energy whereas irreversible computation is going to consume energy. This is very important today as we have uh, reached uh, to the level of integration where we have seven nanometer as the feature size of transistors. So you can imagine the number of uh, such transistors in a chip and uh, operating in the gigahertz range, which means that so fast switching would dissipate energy uh, heat, and in the close proximity, it would actually affect the performance. So once again, it is uh, a computation is called reversible if it is bijective, that is, it can be operated in both forward and backward directions. The input and output vectors, that is, the number of bits uh, that are in the input, uh, uh, they should have the same bit widths to be able to achieve this bijectivity. And uh, the part of irreversibility comes from the fact that the input vectors cannot be always deduced from the output vectors. That means information has been erased when irreversible logic operation is performed, and therefore information has been lost. The OR gate, the classical OR gate that we know of, is an irreversible computation. Why? Because we have two inputs and one output. And, and if you look at the truth table at the bottom right corner, you can see that for three of the com input vectors, that is 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, the output is the same. So by looking at the output, we do not know which of these three were fed into this argument. But fortunately, we can change an irreversible function to a reversible function. First thing is, of course, that we have to have the number of inputs and outputs to be same. So you would need some extra bits at both the inputs and the outputs. The extra uh, input bits, they are usually set to constant values. They're called, uh, and sometimes they are known, referred to as ancilla qubits. And similarly, you have extra output uh, bits. Those are called garbage outputs because the actual function that we want to compute is um, one of the, so in this case, this is the uh, column here, f over here. So the original R function, which was irreversible, is out here. And then we have added one more input, c1, which is uh, set to either 0 or 1. Basically, these are don't cares. And 
we repeat this over here. And if you look at the output value of f, as well as the g1 and g2, essentially it's a permutation. So if you look at the three bit input and a three bit output, and you look at all the combinations, it is uh, the input vectors because you had initially two inputs and you added one more. So you have three input bits. So there are eight combinations to the eight combinations and the input, eight vect input vectors, possible input vectors. Similarly, you have one original output. They were also, it's sometimes called the target output bit and two additional garbage uh, output bits. So again, you have three bits, two to the three, which is eight are possible output vectors. And these are all possible combinations. As you see, there are no repetitions. And all the output, all the eight bit, uh, three bit combinations, eight combinations appear both on the in input side as well as the output side only once. And therefore, it's, it's one to one. And also, we find that it's a complete permutation. However, if you notice that the, uh, the constant inputs and the garbage outputs, you have opportunity to arrange them or to assign the values in a different manner. It doesn't matter. That's why they are called garbage, as long as the function value is the same. So therefore, given an irreversible function, you may have, or it is possible to have, more than one equivalent reversible function. So let's look at some reversible gates. The NOT gate, the classical NOT gate is reversible, as you can see, because it is one input and one output. And by looking at the output, you can uniquely determine what was the input. Another very important reversible gate is what is known as the C NOT gate, or it's the controlled NOT gate. It's a two bit gate, two uh, inputs and two outputs. It's also known as the Feynman gate. So, what happens is if you look at this picture over here, is my mouse visible? If I move the mouse? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So x1 and x2 are the inputs, and y1 and y2 are the outputs. x1 is called the control bit, and x2 is called the target bit. And this is the function that we want to compute. And uh, depending on the value of the control bit, the function is either computed or not. If the control bit is 1, then the function is computed. If it is 0, then it's unchanged. And uh, therefore, the function that we want to achieve is a not uh, operation. So therefore, when if you look at the truth table over here, x1 being the control bit, as long as it's 0, the, uh, the output bit corresponding to the input bit, y1 corresponding to the control bit, always remains the same as the input bit. The output bit corresponding to the target bit because the control bit is zero, nothing happens, and therefore the uh, target output is same as the target input bit. But if the control bit is one, that's when the function uh, operation, the not operation, takes place, and therefore for a zero input and the target bit, the output is one, and if it is one, then the output is zero. So therefore, the NOT operation happens. Now, you can write this uh, truth table in a different matrix form, which is that these rows correspond to the input combination vectors, input vectors, <coughs> for, because you have two inputs, you have four. And uh, the columns also correspond, the columns correspond to the output vectors. And again, also, these are, there are four. So if you notice that, how do we fill in this uh, matrix? So for the input combination 0, 0, the output, which is true, in this case, 0, 0 gives 0, 0, that we have a 1 over there. Similarly, for 0, 1, it's still 0, 1, so we have a 1 over here. But for 1, 0, the output is 1, 1. So for 1, 0 input, it's this entry, which is 1. And similarly, for 1, 1, when the uh, not actually happens because the control bit is 1, uh, this is where you get the 1. So it's not the identity matrix. The C naught 
uh, operation can be represented by this sort of a matrix over here. So it, <clears throat> you can also represent it by Boolean logic like this. Excuse me. So um, next important uh, reversible gate is the Toffoli gate. And that is actually an extension of the C0 gate where you have two control bits and one target bit. In fact, you can have uh, multi control Toffoli bits or uh, gates also where you can have k number of control bits and one target bit. And this, uh, so <clears throat> uh, this incidentally happens to be a universal gate, just as in classical logic, we have universal uh, gate as NAND gate or NOR gate with the help of which we can uh, uh, realize any of the possible uh, two input binary functions. So to achieve a NOT gate from a Toffoli gate, this is the input setting that we need, which means that we set both the control inputs to one, and therefore the <coughs> target qubit is flipped, and you get the NOT operation. So this is where you get the output of the NOT. For AND operation, what you need to do is set the target qubit to zero. And if both of them are one, only then do you get a one over here, because then the Toffoli acts. But if one of them is zero, then nothing happens and the zero is propagated. So it's equivalent to the AND gate. And this is the generalized uh, Toffoli gate, as I said, that if you have n n minus one number of control bits, and uh, so you can write the target output qubit in this sort of a form. Notice that it's the target input bit XORed with the AND of all the input control bits. So it's an XOR. Moving on, you can have a reversible swap gate. So which means that uh, the values of the input are swapped at the output. And you can real, this is the unitary matrix that you have for the swap gate operation. And uh, you can realize them with the C0 gates uh, in this manner. That is, uh, <clears throat> either you can have, so this is a C0 gate with this as the target qubit. And this is a target qubit, and this also is a target qubit. So you need three inputs. Either this realization can work, or this realization can work. Oops. The control swap gate is known as a fretting gate, in whose honor we are having this webinar series. So just like uh, we had C0, or C square naught, here like C naught, we have a control bit and we have the swap gate. If the control bit is one, only then does the swap occur. If the control bit is zero, then the swap doesn't occur. And this also happens to be a universal gate. So this, this is a seminal result of Ed Fredkin. In fact, you can define in general a universal control gate in the sense that you have a control Qubit and some function over here, uh, again, a binary function, a Boolean function. <clears throat> so depending on whether the uh, control bit is zero, then the input passes, the propagates uh, unchanged. If the control bit is one, then the actual function that is defined in this uh, uh, black box here uh, is uh, the output is the uh, function operated on the input B. That is, you can write it that P is equal to A always. And if A is equal to 0, then Q is B. And if A is equal to 1, then Q is Q of B. So this is a function. And you might wonder why I have chosen U. Uh, I'll tell you in a couple of slides. Uh, just remember this. <clears throat> so we do have reversible gate libraries. Um, uh, the NCT library com comprises of the NOT gate, the C0 gate, and 
the Toffoli gate. The TOF3 means that the three input, three output Toffoli gate, which is a C square naught gate. You could also have NCTSF, which is you also include swap and Fredkin. Then you could have generalized Toffoli. You could have generalized Toffoli and generalized Fredkin. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a group in University of Bremen which has worked extensively on synthesis of reversible uh, circuits. They have reversible gate libraries. They have a toolkit which, with which you can uh, synthesize and also view them. Uh, there are other uh, eminent researchers who have also worked in these sort of uh, synthesis uh, questions. Um, Dimitri Maslow is one of them. Uh, when he did this work, he was in the University of Waterloo, but now he's at IBM and is leading the group which is in charge of the Qiskit, the famous Qiskit software for synthesizing quantum circuits through the cloud. To synthesize a reversible circuit, <clears throat> as you can see, I told you that for n inputs, you can have a, num a large number of possible reversible functions because it's n input n output. Remember, for n input one output Boolean function, you can have two to the two to the n number of distinct Boolean functions. For reversible functions, the number is even more. Okay? So um, we can, now to do synthesis, it's a design, so for any design, irrespective of whether you're designing a bridge or a building or a circuit, there are some cost metrics based on which you can say that the design is good. And there are optimization issues related to these sort of synthesis methods. So um, if we are talking of qubits, which is instead of bits, you have qubits in quantum computing, I'll define them shortly, then of course, for classical um, synthesis also, you need to minimize the number of uh, gates, that is the operations, uh, number of bits, that is the input size if possible, and uh, also the number of, uh, you know, um, time steps required from uh, input to the output that gives the time required to perform the computation. You want to synthesize the Boolean function with a circuit which will minimize all of this. Okay. Similarly, for reversible circuit synthesis, you would want to do the same thing. Let's look at a quick example. So I have a reversible function in terms of uh, XOR operations. I have three inputs over, uh, six inputs over here, three original inputs and three extra inputs to make it reversible. And uh, these A0, B0, C0 are the original outputs that I want. And I have added three more garbage outputs to make it reversible, okay? And uh, with each operation, there are some costs associated. So if you have a C0 operation, we say that the cost is one, but if you have a Toffoli operation, then you say the cost is five. And there are some reasons why this is five, because if you decompose the three qubit uh, Toffoli, three bit Toffoli operation to in terms of a sequence of two bit um, C naughts, you would need uh, such five of them. Okay, so that's why the Toffoli gate has a cost of five. Now this, uh, suppose I have this circuit, which is performing uh, this operation described by this truth table. So A0 is A XR1, B0 is AC XR, B XRC, and C0 is this, okay? And if I, um, you know, do it uh, uh, sort of um, realize it, that first I want A0, so I will have A XR1, so that's where I get B0, uh, A0. To get B0, I need AC. So AC is the AND operation. So I use a Toffoli. Then I have B and then I have C. And so this is this line gives me B0. Similarly for C0, I have over this. And I can see that I need three Toffoli gates and 
four CNOT gates, the total circuit cost, if I add up, is 90. But if I make some uh, simplifications, then I can reduce, I can achieve the same uh, functionality of A0, B0, C0, but I can reduce the number of qubits to four over here with only one garbage qubit. And the cost, because I have only one to 40 gate, the cost reduces to 13. And further simplification is that I need exactly three input bits and three output bits. And the cost is, because I am using two to 40 gates, I have 10 and only one not gate, and that's one more. So the cost is 11. I'm skipping over all these simplifications. These are very simple. I mean, you can just play around and do this. So we can see that the same functionality say, can be realized by more than one circuit. And of these three, I one would prefer this one, which has the minimum cost. But how do we get to this? This is a very simple function. So we could sort of see how to simplify. But we want to do this in a more systematic way. And that's what we would like to target. Now, before I go on to how to do this in, uh, synthesis, let me just also introduce quantum logic. So we talked about reversible logic and the issues with uh, reversible logic synthesis. Let me just uh, introduce quantum logic, because I've already referred to qubits. And then I will move on to the synthesis methods. Now, what are the major drivers of quantum computing? See, the, this figure on the top left shows Charles Babbage's computer. It comprises of electromechanical relays. And the one in the middle is our semiconductor, silicon-based, uh, nanotechnology-based uh, chips that we have. Uh, at least one in our pocket. All our mobile phones are as good as uh, computers now of those days. And this is a wafer. These little squares are one of the chips. So in one silicon wafer, uh, you can uh, fabricate a large number of uh, chips. So typically, the wafer is of a uh, diameter of uh, about a feet. And the chips here are about a uh, few millimeter across few, uh, a couple, uh, two to three centimeter by two to three centimeter. OK. <clears throat> Now these chips are getting uh, the feet, the transistor are getting smaller to the uh, level. Um, so this is kind of old. It's not 32 nanometers here. It's actually three nanometers. Uh, some of them will be there. But in classical laws, if you go below 50 nanometers, uh, things are going into quantum mechanical laws. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, because of some uh, special properties like superposition, allows for some amount of parallelism which actually can speed up computational processes. And one more important uh, part, which is relevant to this webinar series, is that quantum uh, computing or quantum logic is reversible. And therefore, it can beat the heat dissipation crisis over here. Okay? So these are the two major drivers of quantum computing. And so how, how are we achieving? Mean, what kind of uh, speed up are we achieving? So for example, the first, uh, after Charles Bennett talked about reversibility, it was in 1981, around 1981, in a lecture by Richard Feynman at MIT. Incidentally, I happened to attend that lecture, but I did not understand the importance of quantum computing then. <clears throat> he said that to uh, uh, simulate um, real, life uh, complex processes like uh, uh, quantum chemistry, um, classical computers would need enormous amount of time. You would have to actually employ quantum mechanics to do that. So that's when quantum computing was being, uh, people started looking at it. And David, Do David Deutsch, a theoretical uh, physicist, uh, showed that actually you do get uh, exponential advantage. The problem that he talked of uh, was a simple one. And uh, along with uh, Joshua, he extended this. So the question was that you're not told the function. All you're told is that the function is either a constant 
<clears throat> or a balanced function. That means for half of the input vectors, it is 0. And for the other half, it's 1. You don't know which half. So you have to tell whether, in this case, <clears throat> because there is only one Boolean bit as an input, so if you have to uh, say whether f of 0 is equal to f of 1. That means it's constant. And if it is not, then it's balanced. Now, classically, you will evaluate f0 once and f1 once. That is two evaluations of f. And then you check the equality and answer. But with quantum computing, you can do this with one. So that gave, uh, you know, it apparently it seemed like you have an advantage that is half the number of computations. But instead of a single qubit, if you had n qubits with a single output bit, and you can extend that to make it reversible, that means there would be 2 to the n number of input vectors, possible input vectors. Can you still say whether the uh, function is balanced or constant? You promise that it's one of them. I mean, it's black box. It's not uh, a function which is neither constant nor balanced. Your job is to say which one it is. And David Josh has showed that classically you would need 2 to the power n minus 1 plus 1 number of evaluations of f, whereas with quantum computation, you need just one evaluation. That showed that you can get exponential speed up. And that was primarily because you could equally superpose all the 2 to the n input vectors. But that was more of a um, theoretical problem. What made people set up was Peter Shor's result, where he showed discrete logarithm, which is uh, which requires exponential time <clears throat> with classical computing, can be done in polynomial time. And that also had a, a significant, um, you may say, a chattering effect, because to factorize an integer that you actually make use of this logarithm. And the cryptography, uh, the cr public cr cryptography was based on the fact that multiplying two integers, large integers, is easy, but factorizing it is hard. Uh, RSA, the famous cryptographic system, was based on this. And um, because it's hard, it worked. With classical computer, it, it, this is the, the table here shows how much time it would take to factorize uh, number having 2,000 digits okay, with classical time and quantum computing time. Uh, in fact, this has given rise to quantum cryptography as well as post-quantum cryptography, moving away from factorization-based cryptography protocols. And then Love Grover showed that uh, you can do uh, search in an unsorted, uh, unstructured database in square root of n, this is not exponential speed up, but it's this quadratic speed up. And there are many others. So those who are interested, you can look at quantum algorithms. So, so all this were di drivers for uh, making quantum computing, but realizing that is still going on. Okay? So the people involved, uh, the first computability model was uh, proposed by Alan Turing, and Richard Feynman gave the ideas in a talk in 81, which was published in 82. David Joshua here and Peter Shore. And then the realization of real quantum computers happened much, much later. And now it's taking off quite a bit. So it makes use of laws of quantum mechanics. And instead of a bit, the basic uh, uh, unit of information in classical computer, you have a quantum bit, which is called a qubit. And it is actually a, so, a linear combination of the two possible states of a single bit, uh, which is called 0 and 1. It's noted in a special kind of a symbolism. It's called the ket, 0 ket notation and the 1 ket notation. And alpha, beta are the um, uh, scaling factors, uh, how you combine them. So this is a superposition of the two, what are known as the basis states. And these are called, called amplitudes. Actually, these can be complex numbers. That gives an advantage. Um, and uh, not only that, it is such that the bar of alpha square plus beta square has to be 1, so that uh, we know from quantum mechanics 
that because of the uncertainty principle, if you measure, you are interacting with the system, and therefore the system, the superposition goes away, and you, it, the system will collapse to exactly one of the possible basis states, either zero or one, and the probability with which it will collapse to these states is related to the uh, scaling factor over here. The fact that you can have a superposition in a closed quantum system allows you to do parallel computation on all possible. So if it is a one qubit, this is what you have. If it's two qubit, four possible um, combinations, and you have a superposition of four states. If you have n qubits, you have a superposition of two to the n states. So the way it's different from traditional computing is that uh, quantum computation is reversible. And uh, the gates I will introduce shortly, not only not and C not you've already seen is a reversible, then there are this very important gate called Hadamard gate. Uh, so all these are uh, important. And these are, the fact that is reversible, this computation is reversible, makes a reversible a study of reversible logic so relevant to quantum computing. In, uh, incidentally, this is a continuous uh, domain. But it so happens, the state space is co continuous, but it so happens that it's a special kind of a vector space that can be represented by a finite number of basis states. And uh, so what this uh, Schrodinger's equation over here shows is psi of t represents the state of the quantum system at time t. And this is the Planck's constant. And this equation tells us how the quantum state is going to change with time. It will depend on this operator, which is acting on the state. And this is called the, this is called the Hamiltonian. It happens to be a reversible operator. So to do quantum computing, what you have to do is apply some reversible operators to change the state from the input uh, state representing the input value of the computation. And gradually, after a sequence of such op op application of reversible operators uh, evolved the system to uh, a state which, uh, when measured, will collapse to the one of the basis states for uh, which cor with very high probability, which cor uh, and that basis state corresponds to the correct output of the computation. So that's how quantum computing happens. And as I mentioned, probability. So the difference between traditional computing is deterministic. Quantum computing is probabilistic. So you may have to do this more than once. Okay. So this seems promising because of the uh, parallelism. But there's a big but, and that's quantum computation is very fragile. It's noise sensitive. Because as you know, the closed quantum system, it's an ideal system. In reality, it's going to be a decay and therefore the state is going to change. So that calls for quantum error correction codes, fault tolerant gates. And as of now, there are different technologies which are being developed. Uh, we will talk about them uh, shortly. So to build quantum computers, we need uh, the theoretical physicists, the uh, experimental ones, to come up with the technology. And as far as the computer scientists are co concerned, we both need theoretical computer scientists to do the algorithm design as well as computer engineers to come up with synthesis methodologies to map these algorithms onto the technology of the Now, David DiVincio, uh, DiVincenzo, in, two th in the year 2000, gave five criteria for uh, synthesizing quantum computers. It has to be scalable. The qubits have to be well characterized. We ought to be able to initialize it very well. And the coherence time, that means the time over which the state doesn't decay to some other state. So this is very important. And that's why noise is going to change this. So, uh, and of course, the universal set, set of gates need to be uh, defined. And finally, the measurement is also very important. So let's look at the synthesis uh, flow. Um, so you start with a quantum algorithm. Uh, you, what the quantum algorithm will have is some classical functions and some quantum functions. 
some of the classical functions may be realizable with reversible logic gates that we saw. Those were zero ones. So how do we do this efficiently? And then there are some uh, quantum gates where the complex operations are there. So you can do some uh, lookup with a module library and come up with what is a non-fault tolerant quantum logic for the quantum algorithm. And then uh, you make use of optimized quantum gate library, depending on the technology that you are using. And fault tolerant quantum logic synthesis is needed. But this is still at the logic level. And then when you actually realize it with uh, in, in terms of the physical qubits, you also have to take into account the error correction. And you have to be aware of the physical design constraints to finally get the fault tolerant physical quantum circuit, which will execute this quantum algorithm. So we need to have good methods to synthesize reversible functions. If you have to folly gate network, then you need to uh, transform these to folly gates into quantum gates, or at least to one uh, bit or uh, two, two bit on operations. And there are other factors such as error correction and uh, uh, technology mapping that I mentioned. So look at the, let's look at the quantum gates. Um, if you have an n qubit uh, gate, remember n qubit means two to the n possible values that you can have in the um, finite number of uh, basis states that you have. And the matrix representation, you'll have two to the n outputs because it's a reversible operation. So you will have a two to the n by two to the n matrix representing each n qubit operation. So this is the identity gate, which is one, one input and one output. So 0, 1, 0, 1. So this is the identity. We also have a global phase gate, which is basically uh, a complex value in addition to the identity gate. Now, these rotation gates are very important, which is not realiz realizable by the, cl the classical reversible gates. So this is as if you are rotating um, by, uh, about the x-axis. The state is rotated. The state vector is rotated about the x-axis by an angle of theta. theta. Okay. So uh, one qubit can be represented by what is known as the block sphere, a unit sphere. So there's an x, y, and z axis. So depending on which axis you use, and therefore the state, the, the zero state is the north pole of the unit sphere, and one state is the south pole of the unit sphere. These are the two basis states. Or you can have, again, two other orthogonal, uh, diagonally opposite um, poles maybe the east pole and the west pole as the plus and the minus get as the two basis states. You can have a number of basis pairs of basis states for the same one qubit uh, representation. But uh, because you have exactly two basis states, you have a uh, two by two matrix for a one qubit operation. And this, these are, as you can see, complex uh, values. So this is the alpha and beta that we showed you. So the state here will correspond to alpha uh, times, uh, uh, alpha will be cos theta by two, and uh, beta will be minus ic sin theta by two, and so on. These, so these are rotation gates. In addition to them, you have fault tolerant gates. So this is something you've already seen. It's just called by a different name. This is the x gate. This is nothing but the not gate that we saw. Okay, and if you notice carefully, the not gate can be expressed in terms of the Rx gate with a uh, um, parameter of pi, the uh, the angle theta equal to pi, and if you multiply by i, you will get the not gate. Similarly, you have the y gate and the z gate, s, t, and let's look at the Hadamard gate. This has this does not have a complex values, but if you apply this on the zero get, that means the one of the basis states, then the output is an equal superposition of the two basis states of um, the alpha 
equals beta equals one by root two. So therefore, alpha square gives you half. So there's equal probability that if you measure, it will be either the zero state or the one state because it's superposed equally. If you want to do some computation, you need to change the equal superposition and bias it towards the base state corresponding to the correct output state. So those were one qubit gates. Here are some two qubit gates. The C0 gate, again, it's a, you can talk of it as a quantum gate. Uh, then there are the swap gate over here, okay? And then you have the, we had the Z gate, you can have the control set. So that now, incidentally, these matrices, remember the U that I had, the controlled U gate, these matrices, because of reversibility, happen to be unitary matrices. So the U actually is required to be an operation which, would, which can be represented as a unitary uh, matrix so that you get reversible operation. Now, what is a quantum circuit? A quantum circuit, you can, just as we represent a circuit, you have uh, a gate and then the output of that gate feeds to the input of another gate and so on. So in uh, digital uh, logic or in any, you know, electrical or electronic circuit, you have this sort of a representation. But I must warn you, in quantum computing, you don't have gates. What you have, if you look at the quantum computers existing today, for example, the Google's 53 qubit quantum computer, IBM recently came up with a 1033 qubit uh, quantum computer, but over the cloud, you can access up to 127 or the Heron processor, which is 133 qubit. So what you will see is the qubits, not the gates, because here what happens is that you are applying the operations as electromagnetic pulses on the closed quantum systems, which are qubits, to change the states. So therefore, what I've drawn here is schematic of, this is a long time, in time step one, I will uh, uh, apply the pulses to uh, affect uh, the two qubits uh, uh, with a C naught operation. Then this qubit, then after that, I will uh, affect the first qubit to uh, have the X, the not operation, and the second qubit as a Z operation, then both the qubits, the swap operation. So this is actually time. In classical circuit, the uh, charge carriers, namely electrons or holes, are the ones which flow from the input of the gate to the output of the gate. Here, there's actually no charge flowing. It's the state which is being manipulated to get the output. Okay? And the way you can um, do the simulation is do the matrix product in reverse. So you have the input vector on which you are applying the matrix here. And then on that, you are applying this matrix and this matrix. So in the reverse order, if you apply, and this is a tensor product because this is happening in parallel. Okay, this is the composition that is done. Um, so by that, you can compute what is the output vector which is the output state that you will be getting after you put this uh, quantum uh, computing through this circuit, okay? And once again, the cost metrics are, I want to reduce the number of qubits, the number of quantum operations, and also the critical path of computation because, uh, you know, the number, uh, the number of uh, time cycles has to be small. Otherwise, the state can change, the decoherence can happen. Traditional technology, it's the area of the gates that have been uh, fabricated on a chip. That is the typical cost metric, along with the delay from the input to the output. So corresponding to, uh, we don't have the area cost, uh, I mean, sorry, for the area cost here, we have the number of qubits, which are physically there, uh, laid out, uh, and uh, the delay corresponds to the number of cycles. Um, so as I said, the quantum, uh, the, the Toffoli gate is realized with, uh, with these sort of 
uh, two qubit gates. The three qubit gate is realized with two qubit gates, and there are five of them, so that's why the cost of the Toffoli gate is five. Whereas it's assumed that all one qubit and two qubit operations uh, take uh, the cost is one. Okay, so now let's move on to the enough of introduction, a fairly long one. Let me move on to some synthesis techniques. Uh, so first, uh, I'll talk about the Reed-Muller based synthesis of reversible logic. Now, what's Reed-Muller representation of Boolean logic? A Boolean function of n variables is if it is said to be in Reed-Muller if it is using the XOR and and not. Okay, uh, so this is the XOR of the uh, so this is the Boolean variable over here, and these are uh, uh, sorry. The, the, this is the these are constants, right? The zero or one. These are the uh, multipliers, and these are the Boolean variables. And either it's the um, uncomplemented or the complemented one. So these are something like uh, that. You had you know uh, products of this. So, so it's like one of the in terms that you have. Okay. So this is the XOR that is, uh, and if all the variables are uncomplemented, you get positive polarity. Each variable, if it is either complemented or un, uh, un, uh, either uncomplemented or complemented, but not both, then it's fixed polarity. Otherwise, it's generalized read moment. Okay, so for positive polarity read polar, uh, you can, any Boolean function we know we can express uh, easily as an XOR sum of product. Uh, you can have an equivalent PPRM using uncomplemented because you can replace each complemented variable by this sort of a uh, expression over here. So uh, if you exp uh, you will get something like this. Okay, so if this was the original uh, sum of product, original uh, sum of product uh, kind of Boolean expression. The XOR sum of product would look like this, and the PPRM would look like this. You can get this from the Karno map itself. You would need some intermediate you know, variables like this. So for Reed Muller logic synthesis, what was done, the Toffoli gates are expressed in this sort of a form Xn, one of the, the, the target qubit. And this control qubit is giving you the factor because this was the and of it. Okay, so these are the control bits. Now we apply Toffoli gates to reduce the number of PPRM terms. Okay, so A1 equals AXR1 is applied to the circuit so that you get the target A and the factor 1. Okay, so remember the example that simplification we did. This is what we started with. We replaced this first equation by an intermediate variable one and over here uh, again we used another intermediate variable same intermediate variable uh, for simplification we use over here and this reduces the number of pprm terms from eight to six and um, so for reed muller reversible logic synthesis what we need to do is it, we, it is complete when the input and output mapping reduces to identity. Input to output mapping reduces to identity. So you start with here and you uh, look at the number of PPRM terms, okay, and you replace some of these by Toffoli gates to simplify. So from six terms, we get down to four terms. And finally, so this replacement finally. If I get this kind of a mapping in terms of these intermediate variables, then this is input output mapping has been converted to identity. And therefore, the number of PPRM terms over here is three. Okay. So I want to do this transformation through Toffoli gates. Okay. And uh, to realize the circuit, which will actually give you as few number of. PPRM terms as possible. So find factors for any output without uh, the literal A, which is the target uh, one. Okay. Uh, so these are the valid factors. Okay. Don't take A. Take either B, C, or one. 
don't take AC because it has A. This is the target. Okay, A, A. I'm sorry. So you replace uh, this part, either these two by an intermediate one or these two by an intermediate one. Okay, then you are actually start building a search tree to reduce the PPRN turns by using topoly gates. Okay? And uh, you insert the nodes created into the priority queue, and you sort them depending on the number of PPRN terms that have been eliminated, pop the queue, and repeat. Let's look at an example, quick example. So initially, we had eight terms. Remember, this is what we started with. Okay? Now, if I uh, replace this, OK? Then I get six terms. If I replace uh, B uh, X R A C, um, then I get seven terms. And similarly, if I replace B uh, X R C, I get seven terms over here. So I have uh, these nodes, the child nodes have been created in the search tree. These are the um, uh, terms that I have. And I pop one of the terms, which was, uh, sorry. So I pop N1, OK, and I expand that. And from uh, I had N1, N2, N3, I get N4 over here, and also N5. But with N5, <clears throat> I have seven PPRN terms. This is bad, because I already have things uh, in the previous level which have seven PPRN terms. I haven't reduced anything. But this has reduced. So uh, <clears throat> this is going to be a good one. And then finally. If I pop N4, then I get the identity, which is three PPRN terms, and this is identity, so it's top over. So in this manner, I have been able to identify the topology gates which I need to realize. Uh, this will converge because uh, of the following uh, things that, you know, VI XOR factor, VI is present in the PPRN expansion, and uh, the factor, uh, and uh, here VI is not present, and of course VI is always this. So union of this type of substitutions are all possible substitutions that can be made in PPRM expansion. And in, given enough time and memory, the entire search space will be searched. Now this was uh, proposed quite some time back. In the meantime, binary decision diagram based synthesis methods for Boolean functions came along. Uh, using uh, either Shannon decomposition or chronicle functional decision de decomposition. You have the decomposition just type list. We don't have time to go into all the details, but I'll just show one example. So this is the uh, PDD is where <clears throat> if you take one variable, look at the two uh, corresponding substitute, x1 equals 0 over here and see what is the equivalent function that you get. And this is what you get over here. Similarly, uh, substitute 1, and this is the equivalent function that you get. Uh, similarly, choose x2 and set it to 0 and 1. Now, it so turns out that setting x2 to 1 and over here and x2 to 1 over here leads to the same function. So instead of a tree you have a diagram over here and the leaves are actually zero or one so from the root node the path which paths which lead to one those paths are the values which will actually the assignment which will give you uh, the uh, the input vectors which will give you one for the function okay <clears throat> So this is BDD uh, decision diagram. This is chronicle function decision diagram. We have a number of them. Uh, so <clears throat> what is done is, again, the DD nodes can be mapped to, to poly and gates with constant inputs and garbage outputs. OK, so if you have a, a non-shared node, no, it's not shared, then you can replace this is the Shannon decomposition to poly realization. This is the pos positive. Uh, Shannon this is the negative Shannon. And if it's a shared node, then you can do this kind of a template over here. So to do, so you start with the um, 
given function that you want to realize as a reversible logic circuit, uh, you start building the decision diagram and uh, in a depth first manner. And as you go, you uh, replace and insert the C naught and the Toffolis. Okay. And in this case, for this example, we find that there are two inputs and two outputs, and the number of lines is seven because there are two outputs and you have five, you need uh, five garbage outputs. And if you do the expansion, this is what you will get as a circuit. Okay? So this is decision diagram based synthesis. If you specify an irreversible function, then DDS can automatically transform an irreversible function specification into a reversible circuit using constant inputs and garbage outputs, as we saw before. Now, if you run a DDS and uh, it was implemented and uh, <clears throat> different uh, uh, functions of the reversible library were realized. And uh, so the costs that we had were qubits, the gate cost, and the number of cycles. So uh, the reed Muller reversible, uh, sorry. Reed Muller based reversible logic synthesis and the uh, decision diagram based synthesis that we have. Okay, these are the benchmarks and these are some cost functions. But Reed Muller RMRLS has uh, needs quite a bit of time because it does a lot of search. PDD based is quite fast, KFDD is fast. Okay, but this, of course, is uh, constructing the decision diagram only. Okay. The DDS based uh, thing is fast. Now, what uh, so RMRLS, the pros are it uses fewer qubits and low quantum cost, but it takes a lot of time and can therefore handle very small circuits. Whereas DDS has is very fast, can synthesize large circuits, can also handle irreversible circuits, but has a large number of. Uh, garbage output. So if you look at it this way, RMRLS over here, it takes more time, but qubit and uh, quantum cost is low, whereas DDS has very little time, but qubit cost and uh, quantum cost, gate cost is high. So what was done is um, RMRLS could be improved that when the circuit is large, the search tree blows up, so you do apply some greedy methods, uh, trace the best node, and uh, so on but it's possible to get stuck so then if you get stuck then you apply dds so you combine the advantages of both to come up with a, in a sort of a hybrid approach to do reversible logic synthesis and that is what is known as the rm dds rm rls and dds together rm dds so it's a hybrid of two and it's a flexible and efficient reversible circuit synthesizer, uh, which is you start with the PPRM, apply RMRLS, and uh, do the retrieval. If, if it's uh, look at the time, if uh, it's time out, then apply DDS, and uh, you go on in this way. Look at whether all the constraints are met. If yes, then you stop. Otherwise, uh, look, uh, you want to update this using, uh, go back to some more PPRM reduction, okay? So for reversible functions, it was found that compared to RMRLS, these are the number of inputs, it could handle more uh, number of qubits. The quantum cost was a little higher, okay? Uh, for, for smaller circuits, uh, it was a little higher than RMRLS, but time-wise, it was uh, doing very well for larger circuits and was completing because it's a mixture of the two. And uh, this is the qubit cost uh, minimization. This is the quantum cost minimization. So you can actually uh, have some knobs what you want to give priority to. For irreversible functions, again, uh, DDS, uh, RMRLS for reversible function. So you compare with DDS in terms of bits and in terms of 
quantum cost, we find that the time it takes a little bit more because it has RMR less in it, but uh, the number of uh, the quantum cost is less, okay, compared to flat DDS. So the benefits to summarize for reversible logic synthesis, RMR less at lower cost, DDS has more. So here was RMR less, here was DDS. So RM DDS, the hybrid thing is somewhere in between. It's flexible and there are trade-offs that can happen. Okay, so given this, Remember the synthesis flow, we had some portions which were reversible, some portions which were purely quantum. So now let's look at how to synthesize purely quantum functions so that we are able to realize the entire thing. And we would uh, focus on fault tolerant quantum. And what is this technology part getting in here? Because in we till now we have these six technologies which seem promising. The ones, the IBM ones are, and the Google ones are superconducting, Rigetti and uh, INQ, they have, uh, the, uh, INQ has iron trap based. There are other companies looking at photonics based and neutral atom based. Solid state um, Intel with QDELF uh, at QTEC is looking at quantum dots, okay? Now, what this shows is depending on the technology, the primitive uh, operation that the technology supports can differ. The number of primitive one qubit operations and number of primitive two qubit operations are different depending on the technology. So it's just like the primary gate library that you have in a CMOS technology. Okay. So you may have done in a technology independent synthesis, you may have used C naughts, but if you are realizing this with uh, superconducting, C0 is not a primitive operation. So you will have to realize the C0 in terms of the primitive operations. Okay, And so the C0 here will have to be realized in terms of Hadamard, CZ, and Hadamard, or a rotation, an uh, RY rotation of minus pi by 2, followed by CZ, followed by RY rotation of plus pi by two. Remember, C naught was, only CZ was here and RX, RY was there, sorry. Again, if Hadamard is not available, then you can have these identities. So depending on uh, number of operations, the cost of C naught will differ in different technologies because the number of oper uh, actual or primitive operations and the number of cycles is going to differ over there. So in your synthesis, you have to keep that in mind as well. Uh, so specifically, C0 can be only realized in photonics, but the other four uh, technologies, it has to be realized in terms of these other primitive gates. CZ is uh, primitive for four of the technologies, but for two of them, you need uh, the cost is more because it's not primitive. So here are some uh, logic identities. In classical digital logic also, you have logic identities similar to that. Uh, here are a uh, number of two qubit logic identities, three qubit logic identities, okay? So, so the length of left-hand side is one, but the length of right-hand side is either two or three. So Notice this one. I, I, I won't go through this. The, I assure you, I won't bore you with that. But just I wanted to show you that uh, A, B, C can be any of the X, Y, Z axes, okay, in a cyclic manner. So if this is X, so let's look at R 1.3A, okay. R X pi is equal to R Y pi followed by R Z pi, okay. And if you visualize this in a in a sphere, unit sphere, you will see that this is actually true. And you can uh, extend this to uh, three operations being replaced by simplified to one operation here. Okay. Uh, 
if you are allowed to, this is only using C0. If you are allowed to use C0 gates, then you get some more uh, identities. And this is going to be made use of in our synthesis methods. So depending on the particular uh, technology, the gates will have different uh, cost, the number of operations. If it is primitive, the cost is one. If it is not, and depending on number of primitive operations, the cost goes up. And the number of time cycles also is going to be different. So for fault-tolerant quantum logic synthesis, and the FTQLS system is available and this appeared in two papers here. So the, we are focusing on this, this thing over here. We talked about this. I won't talk about this. This is basically uh, just as you do, you have a library of modules. Okay, I'm running out of time. So, um, so let me just quickly tell you about first about this and uh, the challenges of this. So the logic level, uh, there are different libraries. One library, uh, there are different fault tolerant libraries. This is called the Clifford group of gates. Um, X, that's the not gate, the Hadamard gate, the Z gate, the S and the S dagger because it's com uh, this is complex. And the C naught gates, and then the T gate and the T dagger gate. Remember the uh, quantum gates that I showed you. So the CTL library has has all these gates, but this library, uh, these many of these gates are not compatible with the existing technologies. So the logic level we have to keep this in mind. It's easy to uh, you know for fault tolerance CTL is fault tolerant. Okay. But uh, if you bring in the technology constraints, then you need to do something more to make uh, have a fault tolerant realization. At the physical level, what happens is there can be noise, so therefore you need to do some quantum error correction. There are uh, three uh, of the earliest ports, error correcting ports that have been shown over here, and we'll see why this is going to uh, pose constraints in logic synthesis. So instead of the CTL, we have a fault tolerant set of gates. Because the Hadamard and the C0 gates are not directly supported, uh, what is done is these are uh, replaced by uh, some approximation of a chain of uh, gates which are realizable. Okay, So the fault tolerant set uses rx ry rz all the te six technologies can realize this okay so and it uses special rotation gates and the hadamard gate which is also more or less realizable as well as the c naught and the swap gate okay but these are actually uh, the uh, the the logic identities come into place so the synthesis flow starts like this. You are given the input circuit. You optimize based on the identities, OK? And then depending on the technology and the optimized gate library, you do further optimization. And then finally convert these uh, uh, gates to the fault tolerant versions, equivalent uh, gates, and get the fault tolerant circuit. And there again, you have scope for optimization to finally get the fault tolerant. So there are three stages of optim optimizations done in FTQLS. So how to do it? Um, OK, I will um, make use of a very, very important result by Soloway and Kitab in 2006, which says that any unitary matrix can be approximated with a cascade of Clifford plus T logic gates with an error threshold of epsilon. Depending on epsilon, the length of the cascade is going to differ. Okay. Now, this has been implemented. And what happens is you get a long cascade gate. Although this is fast and highly accurate, long cascade length means many more gates. So the cost goes up. Fowler in 2000, Austin Fowler in 2011, uh, 
did a proposed uh, heuristic which shortens the basket length, but it takes a little bit more time and low accuracy. So what this uh, the what uh, the FTQLS does, it uses some kind of a lookup table and uh, has a is a mixture of the skipping table and the uh, Soloekita actual. So, for example, if I want to synthesize a non polar tolerant gate, which is RZ5 by 64, then the Solovikita method uh, you can iterate. And uh, if you bring down the uh, accuracy, I mean, error threshold very low, then time is not too much, but the length of the cascade is so high. Whereas uh, in the skipping table, the length of the cascade is very small. But the error is high, and uh, it takes a lot of time. So what FTQLS does, it reduces the number of operations and uh, cycles and interchanges some bits. Uh, so those reduction rules are taken into account for simplification. Then some interchange rules are also there, which can be taken. And you can do some commuting. So, for example, if you have a C naught after an R Z alpha and R X beta, this is equivalent to have performing the C naught before first and then these two. We'll see how this helps. Okay, some of the two qubit gate operations can be moved across this. So the circuit qubit uh, is treated like a graph, okay, and it's in the reverse order. Okay. So what we do is we will traverse the graph in the reverse order. And while we traverse, we can go both forward and backward. We take one qubit windows and see whether we can apply any of the uh, simplification rules. Okay. And then if we can interchange and also do some commuting, if there are two qubit operations, and we can repeat this uh, until no improvement is done. And what we can do is, so in the qubit, if, we, if this is the longest path, it's best to start optimizing along the longest path, trying to shorten it as much as possible, take up the next longest path, so that the critical path number of cycles is also. So here is an exa that example, same example, the source and the sink. So this is the critical path. So on this, we can simplify this. So the sequence of, so these two, these three, Four of them, a sequence of Rx, Ry, Rz, those rules that if you apply them, then you can replace this by a single uh, one over here. And then you can exchange these two across the scene. Okay, so this is the you can also interchange these two. So this is an example of simplifying, replacing this by a single one. You can interchange these two and you can commute these two. And because I commuted, that means I moved this rotation gate past the C0 gate, the C0 occurs later, I can again simplify these two and get uh, something like this. And then uh, again, I have two C0, okay? So I simplify this and these two C0 back to back, you know, they, they just can, can, I mean, uh, you can club them, okay? So these two C naughts are clubbed over here. They, these, this is simplified to this one. This is simplified to this one. And this path over here, again, uh, you can simplify. And ultimately, you get this simple cycle. Starting from here, you get here. Originally, it had 11 operations, 36 cycles. Now it has four operations and 12 cycles. So if we take the quantum Fourier, uh, Fourier transform, the four qubit quantum Fourier transform, before non fault tolerant domain, the first level and the second level of optimization, we got some improvement in the, this was the original, this is the reduction that you get. Um, and these are depending on which technology that you are getting. And after the fault tolerant uh, <clears throat> optimization, you get a large percentage of reduction okay, in terms of number of operations and in terms of number of uh, cycles. Okay, so so 
if we had used CTL versus FDS, CTL, the reduction is very small. So that is before, sorry. Oops. So this is the CTL domain, and this is the FTS domain. So I got very little reduction, but after FTL, so FTS is much more efficient, as you can see, and it's fairly fast. So in general, the average percentage of reduction uh, can uh, lies in this range. Okay, finally, the physical design where I am almost running out of time. Uh, so what is this uh, part of physical design? See, here, uh, in order to perform a two-qubit operation, first of all, the qubits have to be placed, okay? So the, in a certain manner, and only neighboring qubits can, uh, the electromagnetic interaction between them can happen between neighboring qubits, okay? And for um, quantum error correction, if I replace a single logical qubit by a quantum, uh, let's say the Bacon uh, Shor code, a single logical qubit is replaced by nine physical qubits and they are laid out like this, okay? And again, each of these logical qubits you can recursively replace by another nine, okay? So this is, uh, and so this is the logical qubit replaced by nine and then again, this each of these replaced by nine. And why are we doing this? The more you do this, the quantum error correction is going to be better, uh, ideally, theoretically, okay? Actually, there are some other constraints. But the price you pay as a number of qubits is getting very high. So the price for getting uh, noise-free or very low error computing is a very high cost over here, okay? And how you place the qubits so that if you have to perform a... So the error correction, the big and short code, one logical qubit had nine physical qubits, Steen code seven, and mean code is four. And uh, so the QECC OR synthesis is where you not only have all tolerant, but also take into account the nearest neighbor placement. So let's look at this. Uh, so suppose I need to do a swap operation, okay? Uh, I have to do, uh, I have to perform an operation between S8 and S5. Uh, so, uh, S, uh, so S8 and S5 <coughs> are, I actually need a C0 between S1 and S8, but I have to bring them close. So I swap these two so that I get S8 here, and then I bring S8 over here. So then S1 and S8 are next to each other, and therefore I can perform this. Now, how do I place the qubits? That is the placement problem. That is the physical, uh, how I have to do this. And how I perform the swap chain, that is the routing problem. And that is going to affect the number of swaps and therefore, so if this was the uh, mapping Q0 onto this uh, um, 2D layout over here, <coughs> Q0, Q1 and so on, you find that, uh, so this is the mapping that you have. Uh, because I want to do a swap uh, a C0 between Q0 and Q5, I have to bring Q0 and Q5 next to each other. So I perform these swaps, okay? And uh, so Q0 was in S0 and S5. So I moved S0 over here. So two swaps, they bring it, bring over it close by here, perform the uh, C0, and then the next one is S3 and S5, I mean, Q3 and Q4, um, sorry, Q5. But then again, Q3 and Q5 are far. Again, another swap. In this manner, I need six swaps, okay? But if I had a different mapping, I started with this mapping, and I needed six swaps. But if I had S0, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, a different mapping here, I would need just one swap. So if both placement and routing are done carefully, the cost is, can be. Again, the number of operation cost is reduced, okay. For, in the interest of time, this is a greedy algorithm, okay. You do breadth search, traversal on the um, placed interactive uh, qubits and uh, in the circuit over there, 
that is the interaction graph that is the, between two qubits if there is a two qubit operation then there is an edge the number of two qubit operations between them give the weight of the edge and so on so you have a heuristic cost here and you choose the number to be placed next to and you have an initial placement which means that the uh, subsequent swaps are going to be minimized here is an example i'll skip the example and the complexity is proportional to the uh, number of qubits okay and the grid size especially the number of the routing means there are many paths to choose to make uh, so you want to do a c naught between s0 and s8 followed by c naught between s0 and s12 so you can first do this and uh, these so then you need two cycles and uh, so many operations but if you had done a different one then you could do. so you can define cost functions like that uh, window size and all that so the complexity is roughly proportional to this the number of parts and all that so paqcs is actually the fault tolerant quantum logic circuit that you get and you do an optimization of the placement and routing and uh, you have the physical quantum circuit and depending on the technology and the quantum error correction you finally get the fault tolerant uh, final circuit with the uh, error correction blocks okay and depending on what kind of quantum error correction and what kind of uh, technology you will have different uh, cost in terms of this is the number of physical operations this is the number of physical cycles and in uh, with the revlib benchmarks uh, we find that you know how far do you look ahead the actual problem is empty complete so depending on how much time you can spend the window that you look ahead can vary and depending on that uh, how much you can minimize okay and uh, so depending on the number of levels of concatenation and the technology as well as the code the amount of reduction uh, average improvement by this sort of synthesis is given over here okay this is for bacon short code this was for steam code this is for bacon short code this is somewhat less uh, for these two these are the two more promising ones and for nil code again the reduction is less the average improvement is less so in general for um, you know uh, these sort of benchmarks we find that if there are a large number of qubits but small number of two qubit operations placement is important and you get 65 percent of the average improvement but if you have small number of qubits but large number of two qubit operation then routing is more important than placement okay and the window size is also important uh, there were some uh, integer, integer linear programming based uh, operations, but it couldn't handle large number of uh, circuits and qubits. Uh, our method, PAQCS, got 31% improvement over the ILP method and could handle larger circuits. So I'll stop here because I have actually uh, almost run out of time. A lot of problems remain. Uh, we need, we need these error estimation values to be done. And nowadays, those nearest neighbor, in order to overcome nearest neighbor uh, and the issues with the kind of uh, error correcting codes that I showed you, uh, surface codes have been proposed. These are 2D and a planar, but still error estimation is required so that you can uh, make use of that information during synthesis. We also need efficient simulation and validation to check before we can actually realize fault modeling, testing, and quantum verification, reversible circuit verification. If it is just reversible, then most of the standard uh, techniques apply. We need high level languages, more algorithms. Scalability is an important issue, very, very important for quantum computing to come by. And of course, this being uh, related to the cellular automata, we know that reversible cellular automata has a lot of scope. Uh, but there have been some works on synthesis methodologies for reversible cellular, but very little, to the best of my knowledge. 
and so there's a wide scope of uh, work which I have not touched upon, and I leave it to the youngsters to take this up. I will stop here, and I don't know whether there is uh, time for questions. So, thank you, ma'am. That was a very informative and interesting lecture, starting from the most basic information about the gates to the synthesis and error correction and fault tolerance. So, it was a comprehensive lecture. Thank you so much. I believe there will be lots of questions, but we are running out of time. So, I can take two questions. If it's okay with Professor Morito. <laughs> yeah. So, Professor you, Morita, uh, can you give us five minutes? Uh, is he there? Yes. Yeah, he is yes, there. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so any question? Any question from the audience? Some quick questions. Uh, I have a small question, ma'am. Uh, yes. If we consider for the future advancement in uh, quantum circuits, so does it affect the synthesis or optimization of reversible circuits? That means uh, how it will affect the how the future advancements will affect the synthesis or optimization of reversible circuits. Well, uh, it's the other way around, right? I mean, quantum circuits, part of the classical ones, uh, classical functions, you have to realize them in reversible logic. So we need improvement, improved uh, methodologies for reversible logic synthesis, as well as the quantum logic synthesis. So quantum logic uh, synthesis, the fault tolerant part, etc., it's going to be there. But uh, the classical part, uh, the, uh, the one that I showed you, uh, RMDDS, that's kind of uh, still, it's almost 10 years uh, that has uh, it has come up. And uh, I'm sure there are, uh, it, it is, after all, the uh, Original problem is NP complete, so we need, uh, but we can't, you know, just rest by saying that it's NP complete. We, we really need to come up with uh, some methodologies to be able to actually um, realize these circuits and make use of quantum computing, which needs reversible logic synthesis. Uh, there's a question which says, can we quantify the efficiency of reversible Toffoli gates in terms of gate counts? uh yes that's what we were doing right and uh, i should mention that all uh, the rmdds etc uh, i actually recently we have done some very interesting work where i stopped with rmdds we reduced the number of two the gates okay the number of pprm terms and each pprm term we kind of use the two gate but two gates as you saw in the technology table those are not realizable so they have to be further decomposed. And deco decomposing to polygates itself is, again, a challenge. We did some work where we found that we could uh, make use some quantum uh, properties to reduce uh, the to poly, uh, equivalent to poly network and uh, therefore reduce the overall cost. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor Shukhole, for your nice, exciting presentation. You know, so informative to us. So, uh, one time you were mentioning that uh, quantum computing is fragile. So in one slide, uh, you have mentioned this. Yes, thing. yes. So in your opinion, you know, what is future then? If it's fragile, so so many things you have Right. Uh, very, very, 
Yeah, very pertinent question. I didn't have time. So that's where the quantum error correction comes in. Now, what happens is, as we saw, to do quantum error correction, we have we need more bits. So it's actually at a price that you pay. And as it is, we don't we aren't able to realize too many qubits as of now. So what we have today is NISQ error, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing error, which means you have to live with the noise and try to uh, perform quantum computing, taking into account noise, OK? Which means even if you can't do exact uh, quantum computing, one thing that has been tried, even my papers tried that, is circuit cutting. So suppose I have a large, uh, for in order to do uh, meaningful quantum computation, I need, let's say, uh, 200 qubits. But the uh, hardware that is available, the best hardware that I can access over uh, cloud is a 133 qubit uh, machine. OK, so what I can do is uh, it has been shown that a large circuit has a larger uh, probability of error. Uh, so you can cut up the circuit. Circuit fragmentation or circuit cutting is a technique. Now, you have to do that very intelligently so that those small circuits, you can have less probability of error and get the output. And the reason you have to cut it intelligently is because after you get the output of these sub circuits, you have to combine the outputs to get the reconstruct the output of the original circuit. And mind you, quantum computing is probabilistic. So that's what blows up the reconstruction cost. So it's kind of, you know, uh, a trade off that has to be taken uh, for, uh, you know, uh, to be able to actually get some advantage of quantum computing despite the noisy situation. Technologists are trying to build less uh, qubits with less and less noise. <laughs> so that's one end, large number of them. But till we get there, even with what we have, people are trying to see what best we can do by other algorithmic techniques. So the synthesis methodologies that I talked of did not consider that. So there's also scope for uh, looking into circuit cutting uh, constraints when you are doing the synthesis. So, uh, I have another question, uh, if only that I can take, you know, your friend. Yeah. Uh, uh, in your talk, uh, so, uh, you didn't talk much on uh, power consumption. Reversible, yeah. reversible, reversible, reversible. Yeah, so uh, sometimes it is said that if this power consumption is very less or ideally it's no actually. Yeah. But the simulation result you have shown, and at that point, uh, point of time, you have not mentioned any you know, uh, power consumption. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't think uh, we have much information about, you know, the even to feed into the simulator, you know, the qubits, the amount of power consumption, very little is Actually, <laughs> that's the uh, irony, you know, quantum computing is reversible. So no power dissipation in the computation. But to keep it, is, let's say, super uh, conducting, to uh, keep it super cool, you need a lot of power. <laughs> so I, I mean, that's the technology part, uh, which is the peripheral part. But the actual computation is uh, almost negligible. I, I'm not sure how that kind of modeling can be done to estimate the power. I mean, uh, let's just say, if, say in superconductor, or, or let's say a photon. OK, so uh, what is happening is that it's jumping from one state to another state. And the um, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, whatever uh, are the zero state, the ground state, and the next higher state, uh, whatever is the one electron, I mean, uh, whatever are the, um, what do you call the spin levels, 
and that amount of energy which is very very low so we can practically ignore it compared to what we have now the major headache is the cooling and the peripheral power actually issue is if we build, if we can build a computer using those basic uh, basic units which you have shown reversible uh, basic units gates etc but ultimately when you get if i get some computer like this and it will have some power consumption so uh, that comparison may be important you know uh, in the traditional computer classical computers vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the quantum computer and reversible computing the power consumption as a whole no so, no uh, i think one important point is we are not going to replace quant uh, general purpose computers by quantum computers it's all it's like uh, trying to uh, hit a mosquito with a cannon uh, uh, we will so quantum computing is going to be more like a coprocessor only the kind only the portion of the computation for which you can get exponential speed up with quantum computing only that part can you uh, shunt off or uh, give it to the quantum computer because if you run it on the classical computer it's going to take exponential number of steps and that itself over the entire computation is going to consume a lot of energy so you have to be careful what you are comparing you have to compare apples with apples not other way okay thank you uh, okay thank you very much for your attention and professor monita once again I'm sorry for running over and I'm looking forward to your talk. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Okay, some questions are there in the chat, but I think we don't have time to take it right now. So, okay, thank you, ma'am. So I would like to uh, hand over the next session to Supriti to take now.